Hi, it's a pleasure to welcome everyone to our last talk in this uh, autumn's colloquium series. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Yorgos Macris from the University of Texas at Dallas today. Uh, Yorgos received the Diploma of, Elec of uh, Computer Engineering and Informatics from the University of Patras in Greece and the MS and PhD degrees in uh, Computer Engineering from the University of California, San Diego. Um, he spent a decade on the faculty of Yale University uh, and then joined UT Dallas where he's now Professor of Electrical Engineering and he leads the Trusted and Reliable Architectures uh, Research Laboratory. His research focuses on applications of mach machine learning and statistical analysis in the development of trusted and reliable integrated circuits uh, with particular emphasis in the analog and RF domain. Um, he's been general chair and program chair of several conferences in the area of uh, VLSI and has served as associate editors also of uh, several journals in this field. He's a senior member of the IEEE, a recipient of the 2006 Sheffield Distinguished Teaching Award, and a recipient of the Best Paper Award from the 2013 um, Design, Automation, and Test in Europe Conference. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Yorgos. Um, thank you very much for coming to speak to us. Good morning, and thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, I spent uh, a year here on sabbatical about a decade ago, so it feels really nice to be back. What I would like to do today is highlight the role that machine learning can play in enabling trustworthiness and reliability in analog, analog and RF integrated circuits. More specifically, I will introduce a few of its applications in this context, and I will highlight some solutions that my group has developed first at Yale and more recently at UT Dallas. Uh, before I proceed, I'd like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation and the Semiconductor Research Corporation for sponsoring this research. Our focus in the analog and RF domain stems from the fact that this is a very uh, growing market projected to be at $45 billion in 2015 and rapidly growing. Wireless uh, analog RF ICs can be found in a broad, broad range of applications, including wireless communications, automotive, avionics, health applications, sensory systems, and so on and so forth. Evidently, many of these applications are mission critical and therefore trustworthiness and reliability becomes crucial. So what are the threats that we're concerned with in this context? There are many, and today we will discuss three such concerns, manufacturing defects, process variation, and malicious functionality, also known as hardware trojans. There are many more. For example, one might be concerned about design marginalities or counterfeit integrated circuits, and for these, machine learning solutions have also been developed, both by my group and by other groups. Uh, but in the interest of time, we will just focus on these three threats today. Let's start with manufacturing defects. Semiconductor manufacturing is a very complicated process, so uh, defects in the chips that we fabricate are not uncommon, whether because of material impurities, mask misalignment, equipment drift, etc. many of the dye that we fabricate don't actually work. So before we sell these chips, we have to test them and make sure that they comply to their specifications. This is an expensive process uh, involving expensive automatic test equipment and a lot of measurements. So what I will describe in the first part of this talk is a machine learning based solution wherein we use classifiers and very low cost measurements to replace the expensive tests and reduce the cost of testing chips to make sure that they work. Um, these complicated semiconductor manufacturing processes become even more complex and harder to control as we go down in technology nodes. Uh, the process variation, the lack of control that we have, results in chips that come from a distribution, some of which ends up outside the region that is acceptable, and those are failing chips. Now, designers are doubly constrained because on the one hand, they want to have high performance, which brings in more revenue, and on the other hand, they want to be able to make most of the chips work, to have high yield of the manufacturing process so that they can make more revenue. So in that quest, designers have recently started adding more tuning knobs into their designs such that each chip can be individually calibrated after it is fabricated so that we can tighten the distribution and bring it within the acceptable bound. Uh, 
So in the second part of this talk, I will describe a regression-based approach which allows us to rapidly, with only one measurement, one set of measurements, uh, calibrate uh, an analog RFIC after its fabrication. The third concern is hardware trojans or malicious functionality. The semiconductor industry has been globalized over the last 20, 25 years to the point where it's no longer vertically integrated and a company rarely controls all the steps involved for building the chips. So the concern that comes along with that is whether there is anything extra in the silicon that you receive back from the fabrication facility. In other words, how do you know that the chip that you get back does exactly what it is supposed to, nothing more, nothing less? What if there's malicious functionality that a perpetrator can take advantage of and either incapacitate the chip or cause it to uh, behave erroneously? So in the third part of this talk, I will describe a side channel fingerprinting method, which allows us to search for hardware trojans by looking at the parametric space of the functionality of a chip. Now, all these three solutions are applied pre-deployment, before we sell a chip and put it in uh, to work. And uh, the solutions that I described are implemented in, in software. In the last part of this talk, I will explore the possibility of porting this functionality directly in silicon by through the design of uh, on-die analog neural networks. By doing so, we enable new applications. Specifically, a chip can now be will now be able to test itself through built-in self-test. So if it ages and it starts drifting outside the acceptable range, as an alarm signal come on, can come on to indicate that the chip no longer is functional. Similarly, a chip can be able, will be able to self-tune, uh, adapting to the environment conditions. If you're close to a base station, you might need less power to operate within specs, for example. And the last one is self-trust monitoring, because some of the malicious functionality might be dormant at test time and wake up later, uh, get activated in the field, so you will miss an opportunity of detecting it. So I will discuss our work on, uh, on the analog neural network implementation for these specific applications. Okay, let's get started with the first application, the test cost reduction for analog RFICs. When chips come out of production, we need to test them. We need to make sure that we interface them with this expensive piece of equipment, the ATE, through which uh, a lot of electronics on the interface board is used to generate stimuli, excite the chip, measure responses, and compare the performance parameters of a chip to its design specifications so that we can decide whether a chip passes or fails. Uh, the cost of this amounts to up to 35% of the final cost of a product. And especially in the RF domain, the higher the frequency, uh, the higher the cost. It grows exponentially. And if you go into millimeter wave or terahertz, we don't even have high volume manufacturing test solutions. So what we developed a few years back is a classification-based approach to reduce the need for expensive measurements in high volume manufacturing test. Specifically what we do is that we take a representative set of chips, our training set of chips, on which we will measure all the expensive specification tests. So we will have the ground truth information of whether it's these chips pass or fail. Alongside those, we will also take a bunch of simple measurements, low cost measurements that we're willing to take on every chip that is being produced. And then we will project the labeled data on the measurement space of the low cost measurements. The next step would be to learn the boundary in that space. And I'm showing it in two dimensions, but you can project it in multiple dimensions. The boundary that separates the nominal population, the, the good chips, from the faulty chips. Uh, once you learn that boundary, you can essentially use it to reduce your test cost for the rest of your production. Because essentially, the machine learning approach infers whether performances comply to their specifications or not by using just these few simple measurements and the learned boundary. So for every new chip that comes out of production, we can take the same alternate measurements that we decided to uh, uh, allow for every chip, we can present them to the train classifier, and then the classifier will compare the footprint of this particular chip on the measurement space to the boundary. And if it is an acceptable zone, it will call it a passing chip, otherwise it will call it a failing chip. So in this way, we can reduce test quite drastically. Now, there are a lot of questions that can come up here, and there's a large body of literature that has addressed almost all of those. For example, what kind of a classifier do you need? 
We've played with support vector machines, with neural networks, with decision trees. Uh, Nonlinearity is essential. If you use a linear classifier in this space, it won't work very well. Another question might be, how do you get a representative set of chips? And how do you get a balanced set so that you have enough faulted chips and enough good chips? And there are statistical methods to balance and enhance your population through density estimation, for example. Uh, a third question might be, well, the process drifts. The process moves around over time, the fabrication process, so the statistics might become inaccurate. So somehow we need to close the loop and make sure that we update that boundary periodically. And all of these questions have been looked at in, uh, in the literature. <coughs> what I will show you here is one experiment that we did with Texas Instruments. What you see is a Bluetooth wireless LAN RFIC. Uh, we were given data from Texas Instruments from about 1.2 million devices coming from 176 wafers. On these devices, the regular analog RFIC test would comprise 367, 367 measurements. Uh, along with those, uh, TI has instrumented this chip with what they called orbits, on-chip RF built-in tests. These are very simple structures that they put on chip to take all sorts of different measurements, DC currents, loopback measurements, phase error, cap scans, etc. So the problem here is to replace the 367 expensive performance measurements with the 739 simple tests and still arrive at a very accurate pass-fail decision. Uh, so what we did is that we took the die from the first wafer, chronologically the first wafer that was produced, and we trained our classifiers. And then we evaluated how well this operates on the remaining 175 wafers of the production. So since we have 739 measurements, that's a very large dimensionality. So to avoid the curse of dimensionality, first we do uh, dimensionality reduction. We use the genetic feature selection algorithm here. And uh, then we train a neural classifier with the, first, the data from the first wafer. And then we applied that boundary that we learned on the first wafer on the remaining 175 uh, wafers. The results look like this. Um, there are two terms to evaluate quality. Test escapes and yield loss. Test escapes are chips that are bad, but the classifier calls them good. And yield loss are chips that are good, but you're throwing them away. Uh, we biased the, the boundary that we learned so that we favor a lower test escape rate because the company is, inter is more interested in not selling bad chips than losing a few uh, extra yield. So you see that even from le learning from one wafer and then applying it to the remaining 175, we were able to reduce, to have a very low error in the, in the range of 1.3% test escapes, and 6.4% yield loss. In terms of how much uh, cost would have been saved, I'm not at liberty to release exact numbers, but uh, the orbits, the on-chip tests, are substantially cheaper than specification tests, meaning at least two orders of magnitude cheaper. So there's a lot of benefit if you're able to do this in millions of chips in production. Of course, you can't go in production with these rates. These are too high, and we don't, uh, propose to replace specification tests entirely with the alternate low-cost tests. Instead, what we are advocating is a two-tier system where first you use your classifier, you decide whether you fall in a predominantly good or predominantly bad area, in which case you have high confidence in making a decision through the classifier. If you fall in a gray zone where you're not so confident, you're right on the cusp, and you don't have enough data or enough statistics to make a decision, then you can funnel this chip back to the regular system of testing it where you will pay more, but you will get 100% uh, accurate uh, decision. So we essentially try to enable the test engineer to explore the trade-off between test cost and test quality through this guard banding approach. And we applied this idea in an experiment that we carried out at Intel um, Intel wouldn't do it on their own chips, but they were willing to buy off the shelf uh, the RFMD2411 chips from analog devices. Uh, essentially, this chip has an LNA and an amplifier and a mixer on the chip. So they bought 541 devices. 341 were used for training, and 200 of those were used for testing. We considered 13 different specifications at one of the bands, at the 150 megahertz band. 
And you can see the different configurations that they used in order to measure the various performances. Um, our low-cost tests were obtained as following. A uh, seven, carefully crafted seven-tone signal was applied and upconverted through an external mixer. It was then applied to the LNA followed by the on-chip on mixer which downconverted the signal. The output was passed through a low-pass filter and then Fast Fourier Transform gave us the signature of this chip in the, uh, in the form of tones. Uh, we had about 28 tones above the noise floor. So these were, were our alternate measurements. Essentially, with these 28 tones, we wanted to call the chip good or bad with respect to all of its specifications. So using this two-tier test system that I mentioned, we got the following results. If you did no uh, second tier, so if everything passed through the uh, classifier, you would have about 4% error. That error dropped to below 2%, if you were willing to retest through the expensive measure about 11%, 11.5% of the chips, and went down to zero, uh, if you were willing to retest essentially one every four chips. I should also say that since those chips were bought off the shelf, uh, they're all good chips. So we had to tighten the specs a little bit so that we can call some of them bad, which means that the two distributions now that we have to separate are very tight together because they're all good chips. So, Essentially, this is a, a, a pessimistic view of how well this can work in practice. So we're giving the opportunity to the test engineer to explore that trade-off of how to leverage machine learning to reduce test cost while not sacrificing too much test quality. Question. Yes. So can you sort of walk me through it? How would it work in the case of noise figure? So noise figure, so it's pretty clear cut in, in production, right? You get a number, it's above, you know, you gotta throw yes. it out. It's below, okay, we keep it. The classifier, how would it help me, you know, accurately figure out whether this chip has sufficient noise figure, which is usually one of the okay. big ones that's, that's important. Uh, kind of, what is, what is it doing, you know, in that process to more efficiently measure noise figure, characterize it? Okay. So, so uh, the question is, uh, how does the classifier essentially obtain or reflect any information about the uh, individual performances. So the underlying assumption is that there is a correlation between the low cost measurements and each of the high end performances that you want to measure. Now that correlation cannot be expressed analytically through a closed form formula. I cannot express noise figure as a function of these 27 tones, but I can statistically learn it. So the classifier learns it through the weights that the synapses are programmed to have. Uh, if you want to think of it a little bit differently, you could train a regression model that could give you a value for noise figure as a function of these 27 tones or a subset, subset thereof. Uh, and that value would be learned directly from the data. Now, there might be statistical artifacts and there might be from a designer's point of view, it might not be obvious why noise figure is this particular function with this particular coefficients of the low cost measurements. But you learn this from the data, and that's uh, how you get this information. The data, these are more simplified measurements. Correct. That are being taken, like bias, current, um, voltage at a certain node, things like that. And from, from there, you're trying to predict a correlation between the noise, between that and the noise figure performance, between that and the IP3 performance, Correct. between that and, you know. Uh, exactly. Okay. So you're learning the correlation from the data itself. Now, you're bringing up an interesting point because not all measurements might be correlated. So if you just take some random measurements, it doesn't mean that they will have enough information theoretic content to reflect IP3 or gain. So the choice of the measurements, the feature extraction part of the problem, has to be done in conjunction with the designer. In this case, for Texas Instruments, the designers added all these orbits that would reflect various aspects of the design. Okay, let's move on to the second application, which is the post-production performance calibration. As I mentioned, a designer who needs to ensure high uh, uh, performance uh, has to face the problem of process variations. The more aggressive the design, the more 
uh, the chips will be affected by process variations. So essentially, if you are designing a chip to meet some performance specifications, and this is just a cartoon for in two dimensions here, uh, if your design center is in this position, it is likely that because of process variations, the performances of your chips in production are going to come from a distribution. Some of them will even fail. Okay? Now, if you push the specifications and you want a much higher performance desi uh, design, you will probably move your design center and become a little bit more aggressive, which will create a longer tail in your distribution, which means that more chips now will end up failing. Those that will pass will fit your high uh, performance objective, but you will have a lot of yield loss. So the objective of post-production calibration is to essentially push this distribution back over the hump so that you can recover most of the lost yield. So what is being done in many designs is that tunable components are added, and those are individually calibrated after every chip is fabricated. Um, so essentially, you take the chip, you measure some things, and you decide how to tune these knobs to bring its performances back within specs, uh, or even to optimize its performances. So for example, you could be selecting a knob setting for which the design passes and minimizes power consumption. Okay. And there's a lot of uh, interest in this problem, both from the design community that is designing the knobs, and from the test community, which is figuring out efficient ways to select which knob position uh, that the device should be set at. So a naive way of doing this tuning is an iterative test and tune performance calibration, where you essentially put your chip on the tester. It has, the population has an initial distribution. You measure if it's a chip is compliant to specs, you pass it, otherwise you go back and pick a different knob setting. And essentially through this iterative process, you try to shrink the, the distribution and put it within the bounding box of your performances. Now, as I mentioned earlier, test is expensive. So if you keep doing this multiple times, what will happen is that you will spend more on fixing the chip than you will profit by selling it. So iterative test and tune is not a viable uh, solution in this environment. Also keep in mind that after you've tuned it, you probably want to do a final specification test step to make sure that you tuned it correctly before you sell the chip. So a cost-effective calibration or post-fabrication tuning cannot rely on iterative. It has to be in one shot and cannot rely on expensive specification testing. We essentially need a cheaper way of taking some low-cost test measurements and with these decide what setting to put the knobs at. Eventually, the final setting is programmed permanently on the chip through on one-time programmable memory or trimming or something like that. So in 2010, we introduced a method which at the time we demonstrated using simulation data. Uh, today, I will show you real measurements. Essentially, what we do is that we, again, use the exact performance, the specification tests and the low-cost measurements to learn to build the regression models that I was mentioning earlier, which will tell us as a function of uh, the knob settings and the low-cost measurements, what the performances are going to be. So now we're going not to just say pass-fail for IP3 or noise figure or gain, but we will actually predict the value using the low-cost measurements. And in fact, what we did is that we can do this for every knob setting. So knob setting becomes an input variable to the function. So then in production, for every chip that comes out, we take the low-cost measurements, and for every knob setting, we can predict the performances. And then which one we choose among them? Well, you can apply your favorite optimization criteria, and I will show you a couple of those. The novelty here is that this was the first work that did this with a single test without changing the values of the knobs. So by just measuring the alternate tests, the low-cost tests, at the neutral position of the knobs as it comes out of the fab, we were able to very accurately predict the performances for every setting of the knobs. Um, this is not the only work, obviously, that exists in this domain. And I will show you another two in a comparative study that we did recently. Uh, but let's go back to the question of the optimization criterion. If you're trying to maximize yield, your objective is essentially to make your chip as robust as possible. So pick the knob setting that brings you as far from the specification limits or in the middle if it's a two-sided limit as possible. So the max spec plane distance 
is what we used, which is essentially a normalized version of a Euclidean distance from the limits of your specs. So once you know the performances for every uh, knob setting, pick the one that makes your device most robust. That will probably cost you in terms of power, and we know that power is very important, especially in wireless uh, chips. So another way to do this is to select among the knob settings that pass the specifications, the ones that either give you the minimum power consumption, well, that could be a little aggressive because of uh, statistical error, you could be losing a few devices there, or compromise and pick the median power. Um, the other two methods that I will show you, which are competing to this one, um, uh, were proposed, one by Professor Chatterjee's group at Georgia Tech. Uh, they essentially do something very similar. They use the alternate tests and the regular tests, but they first decide what the optimization criterion is, and then they create functions which will give you uh, the, uh, the optimal knob setting directly for this criterion. Uh, the, the limitation of this work is that it makes an assumption that the knob effects are orthogonal. So as you tune each knob individually, there's not going to be any cross correlation, which is fairly difficult to achieve in, uh, from a design point of view, but not impossible. Uh, the third technique that is essentially uh, in the same category is very similar to what we proposed. It was actually done by one of my former students who is now in France. The novelty of that approach is that their low-cost test measurements were non-intrusive. So essentially, they did not want to touch the signal path at all, and they create dummy stages which were placed in close proximity to the original stages, whether it was a resistor, capacitor, gain stage, etc., to understand through these non-intrusive measurements how process variations affected a particular chip. So, uh, and with that information, they were then able to do the exact same thing that we did with intrusive measurements, essentially pick the best knob position. So we did a, a comparative study which was published a couple of months ago. Uh, we took a fairly simple LNA which we designed and fabricated in a 130 nanometer uh, IBM RF process. These are the uh, specifications. It's a 1.575 GPS frequency uh, design. On the same chip we have a voltage controlled oscillator as a signal source and a peak detector to give us the alternate low cost measurements, which is a, a fairly inexpensive measurement and easy to process. And we also had some test coupons, these are the non-intrusive measurements, a resistor, an inductor, and a transistor, which we use to mimic what Harald Lambos's work did uh, in France as non-intrusive sensors to get the alternate tests. So uh, we had three knobs, all voltage biases, as you can see up here. And we fabricated a chip. On each die, we had four of these LNAs and the VCO and the test coupons. Uh, each LNA had its own peak detector. The VCO was shared among all four of them. Uh, we got 40 chips back, 36 were functional. Four of them did not work. Um, we measured four specifications. At the time, we had left noise figure out. Now we have also done the noise figure and the results are very similar. We have those three voltage biases with seven settings for each, and uh, I mentioned already what the sensors look like. So when we applied the three methodologies, uh, to apply these methodologies, we have these three knobs, seven settings per knob, so 343 combinations to choose from. Obviously, we can't try each one of them, test the specifications, and pick the best. So what we do is that we only take the measurements for one knob setting, we make predictions of what the parameters would look like for every knob setting, and then among them, we choose the one that best fits our optimization criterion. So three different frequencies of the VCO, so we get three different peak detector measurements. We also measure the non-intrusive sensors, and then for each of the 343 parameters, we have measured everything, so we have the ground truth entire data set to begin with. With this data set, we do the following experiment. We divide our 144 LNAs, 36 die times four, into 80 for training and 64 for testing how well we can learn the models. And we repeat this process 10 times, that's 10 cross validations, so that we can avoid any statistical artifacts. So here's how well these three methods work. The 
before tuning the devices, on average 19.4 out of the 64 in the test set were uh, failing at least one of the specifications. After calibration with Professor Chatterley's method, that number dropped down to 6.8. In our case, it was 3.6, and what was very surprising, pleasantly surprising, was that the method from the group in France, even though they didn't even touch the signal path, just by looking at the measurements from the resistor, capac uh, inductor, and uh, transistor, they were able to bring this down to 3.8, which is very close to what we achieved using the um, uh, peak detector measurements. So, what this graph shows is how these values change as we uh, play with a number of samples in the training set. So the numbers here, oops, I'm sorry, the number right here at the 80 point are what you see on the table, and this is the trajectory if we had used 8, 12, 16, et cetera, devices for training, so we would have seen less statistics or models would be a little less accurate. You see where we started and where, where we ended up. Um, and this graph shows the various performances that for all of the devices, essentially the histogram of what the device performance distribution was before tuning and what it ended up looking after tuning, which is uh, the blue line. You can see power being reduced and a lot of the performances that were failing now being pushed over the line. Question. Yes. So the, the knobs on the yellow and A, I wonder if you could go back to that one. Um, question that I would have, are you modulating these knobs in production testing? So you take a test, maybe it's a little bit off, I adjust the bias one, retest to get it. In. So is the calibration actually taking place no. through the, the testing? So where does the, because presumably, I'm used to chips where, you know, before normal operation, let's say it's a TDD system, every time frame, um, before we fire up the receiver or the transmitter, I have a couple hundred microseconds where all across the chip, there's calibration routines being run. Every, everything's being adjusted for temperature, every mm -hmm. single TDD frame. So it seems like when you're in production testing, presumably you would already have run all these calibrations across the chip, then I, I take the test. So I guess where does this knob tuning come into the, the Just, testing um, portion? Okay, there are two different places where you can do this knob tuning. One is right after production when you're doing production testing. And this is to recover yield. So now you have a chip that is failing one or more of its performances and you have these knobs that you can tune to bring the performance back within specs. Once you find the value that this knob... Are those knobs on chip? Or they yes, on they're on chip. And you can eventually store their final knob value in a non-volatile memory. So once you find the value, let's say no, uh, the voltage bias one has 1.1 volts, okay? Then you need to have also a DIT way where you will store the code for the 1.1 volts, and that will essentially uh, bias, provide that particular bias on chip. There is a lot of design uh, questions about how to exactly build those, uh, which we have not addressed yet, but the idea is that you will calibrate such that every die that you sell will have a different code for every knob. And that will be, the, the user will be oblivious to this because it will be stored permanently on the chip. Well, why not just lump it into the normal calibration that takes place every time I fire the, the chip up? And just calibrate, right? Why store it? It's, there's going to be calibration that's going to take place. It has to okay. across the chip. Because the algorithm needs to obey. Actually, you mentioned VCO, the bank. Which bank we're going to select? That's every frame that is time frame that's being recalibrated, picking a bank. You could then go through and store all of these in memory. Right? But then somewhere in there, the chip's being calibrated for a certain time frame. And why not just lump that all in there rather than store this in memory through production? It seems like. Well, it depends because when you have a, an, a, let's say, a transceiver system and you have computational power to do the calibration on the chip itself, then potentially you could do that. But if you have a low cost component and you don't have a microcontroller or a DSP or something to run the algorithm that will choose the correct value, then you do this to save the chips that would otherwise fail. And then you permanently program it. Not all uh, chips would have to go through this uh, calibration phase every time you power them up. Presumably if we're talking about CMOS LNAs, 
right? And uh, for, for large production testing, standard, standardized chips, I would assume that these are systems on a chip where there's a lot of digital, there's the integrated inside the chip, so microcontrollers, powerful calibration routines can be, you know, sent off in just a tiny sliver of that, that chip, the digital that's on the chip. So I guess I'm a little lost there. Okay, anyway, why don't we continue? Okay. We can take this one. Okay, let me now move on to the third part of the talk and talk a little bit about hardware trojan detection in wireless crypto, uh, cryptographic ICs. So as I mentioned earlier, the globalization of the IC design and manufacturing uh, industry has raised the concern of how do we know that the silicon we get back does exactly what it is supposed to, nothing less, nothing more. Having an entirely trusted Supply chain, the cost would be very high. IBM does have or did have a trusted foundry that uh, US government is leveraging, but there is limited capacity. Um, so that is a very high cost proposition. And of course, impact of malicious hardware in sensitive applications can be devastating. So the concept of hardware trojans, which has been around for about less than a decade, it's a fairly contemporary uh, research area, uh, refers to hidden or malicious circuitry which can cause errors, it can leak sensitive data, and it can even incapacitate a chip uh, during its uh, operation. Now, how do you compromise a circuit? A uh, hardware trojan can get into your chip through third-party IP, and most F SOCs today have a lot of third-party IP, and it's almost impossible to exhaustively verify every single piece of functionality that this third-party IP provides. Or it could be done all the way down to the mask level. You can, uh, a knowledgeable and resourceful adversary could modify the masks at the foundry. Uh, there's a lot of research in this area, as I mentioned. Um, hardware Trojan, there's a couple of overview articles that introduce the concepts and provide taxonomies. Uh, there are several examples of hardware Trojans that researchers have essentially come up with to demonstrate what is possible and um, scores of different detection methods, essentially spanning from imaging techniques to reverse engineer what your chip structures are, and from there build an at list, um, enhancing traditional functional testing so that you can uncover more or uh, examine more functionality. And uh, the most popular one has been what is called the statistical side channel fingerprinting uh, uh, approach. And, um, as f different side channels, people have used power, delay, temperature, even though it is very slow changing, voltages, and so on and so forth. Some of this work was done by my group back in 2008. Um, the majority, vast majority of the work has been in the digital domain, in the area of hardware trojans. There's very little in the analog so far on the literature. Uh, at some point, we decided to look at the problem in a very specific context, the context of wireless cryptographic chips. So in a wireless cryptographic chip, you have a circuit that generates, that generates a message, the plain text. That message gets encrypted through a key that resides on chip to become ciphertext, and then the ciphertext is passed on to the wireless transmitter that transmits the ciphertext over a public channel. So in this context, there's a very tangible objective for the attacker, which is to steal your key or your plain text. Of course, to do this, the attacker has to be very careful so that they don't get detected. So somehow, the extra information needs to be hide uh, as additional structure on the parameters of the wireless transmission signal. The attacker does not have access to the chip. All the attacker has is access to the wireless transmission channel. So, uh, somehow we need to hide the information in the parameters of the transmission. We cannot be transmitting extra bits because that would be too obvious and would be detected. So the assumptions here is that there should be no violation of the digital, analog, or system level specifications of the chip, and that the structure of the leaked data, how exactly it is encoded on the signal, uh, is only known to the attacker. The defender doesn't know the exact way through which the message is leaked. And, uh, what the attacker can leverage is the fact that there's always a window for any constraints that we have so that we can deal with process variations or, or noise. Uh, there's a little margin that we allow. And if you can hide the footprint of the uh, Trojan within that margin, 
then you could potentially go undetected. So we designed and fabricated a fairly simple wireless crypto IC as a proof of concept. The digital part has a pipeline to advanced encryption standard core. The message, the, the ciphertext gets stored in a buffer and then it is transmitted through imp, uh, impulse radio. It's a very simple UWB transmitter, not following any particular standard here. Um, this is the chip. It was built in 350 nanometer TSMC. There are three versions on the chip. There's a Trojan free version, and there are two versions that have a Trojan in them. The first Trojan hides the information in the amplitude of the transmission, and I will show you exactly how we modulate the amplitude to leak this information. The second one does the same using frequency. Um, this is a clean transmission. This is transmission of a logic one, and this is transmission of a logic zero. And this is the only information that, that the attacker sees. Obviously, the, the spec here is much wider. There's a little margin of how far up and how far down these uh, pulses will be, what the, both in terms of frequency and in terms of amplitude. And you can do the same with uh, phase, although it's a little bit more complicated. So what we did is that we tap into the register that holds the key on the AES part, and we take one bit at a time and we pass it to the transmitter. So uh, we don't change any functionality on the digital side and we don't change any functionality on the analog side. The only thing we do, let's say for Trojan 1, is that we insert a very simple PMOS transistor. So we turn this transistor on when the key that we want to leak has a value of zero. And uh, same philosophy for uh, frequency uh, through Trojan 2. And this is a circuitry that modulates the extra information, the bit value on the frequency. Now what this does is the following. If I'm transmitting a one, a logic one, and the stolen key bit that I want to leak is one, I will leave the signal intact. If the stolen key bit value that I want to leak is zero, I will just put some extra juice in the system through that PMOS transistor so my amplitude will suit just a little higher. The difference is small, uh, so indiv individually this transmission is perfectly legitimate, it's not violating any uh, specifications. Same when I'm transmitting a zero. When the leaked bit is zero, I just increase a little bit the amplitude, and when it is one, I just leave it intact. And the same thing happens in frequency, where I just increase a little bit the frequency, but always within the uh, margins allowed for process variation. This figure is quite important because it shows why we can leak the key and go undetected. What you see on the top part is the measurements of transmitting a logic one and a logic zero from the 40 Trojan free chips. So this is the distribution we got, even though most of these chips come from one or two wafers, uh, depending on how Moses did it, you see that there is quite some variation. So the red line is the median plus minus three standard deviations envelope of these 40 lines. What you see on the bottom is the same information from the 80 Trojan infested chips. The red line is the same as above. I just copied it down here. So if I gave you any of these blue lines, in itself, you have no way of telling me which of the two distributions it came from. Because even though the transmitted signal might have a little bit more amplitude or frequency, it's still within the margins allowed for process variation. So individually, by looking at one transmission, or one bit of a transmission, you cannot figure out that there's something extra riding that wave. So what this shows is the measurement of transmitting a text, ciphertext of zero with key of one, key of zero, and then text one, key one, text one, key zero. And what the attacker will do is that they will listen to the channel and eventually realize that there's a, since they know how the information is encoded, that there's a relative difference. So once you know the two different levels that you see in the transmission, you know which bits leak a zero and which bits leak a one, and you can very quickly decode the message. Now, I'm showing this with a very simple modulation, just uh, playing with the amplitude, but you can think of much more complicated schemes. This is just a proof of concept of a general uh, principle that there is room left there that an attacker could exploit. So the statistical side channel fingerprinting method that I mentioned does the following. We start with a trusted population of chips. These are good chips and we can discuss how we can, you can get your hands on, on trusted chips on which you measure 
se several parameters. Uh, this could be power, delay, current, temperature, etc. And in the space of these parameters, you train a one-class classifier to learn the trusted boundary that encloses this population. When you have a new chip to test and to evaluate for the existence of uh, trojans, you take the exact same measurements, you project it on that space, and if it is inside the trusted boundary, you call it a trojan-free chip. If it is outside, you call it a trojan-infested chip. Okay. Um, so we applied this method on our chips. The measurements that we took are the following. We transmitted six 128-bit ciphertext blocks, and we measured the transmission power, the total transmission power for each of these blocks. Then from that six space, we did a six dimensional space, we did dimensionality reduction into three principal components. And what you see here is the projection of the good population, the Trojan free devices on that space. We then trained a one class support vector machine to learn that space. And then we projected the 80 Trojan infested chips. And as you can see, because the profile of the transmission power changes, and it changes in a systematic way, even a, the simplest of statistical analysis, such as principal components, can give you, can differentiate the, the populations. The trusted population, comes. those measurements come essentially from a different distribution than these measurements and these measurements. And hence, we're able to detect the hardware trojans and, uh, and yet enclose all the trusted chips within the population. Um, now, in the last part of this talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about on-die learning. So as we were developing all these applications, there was always the question, well, can you do it directly on chip? Because a chip might age and eventually fail its spec, so I would like to be able to apply my low-cost test directly in the field through a built-in self-test procedure. Or I might want to adapt how uh, the operating point of a device by calibrating it in the field. Or I might want to detect a hardware trojan that was dormant when I tested the chip, but at some point might get activated. So all of this requires that you incorporate in your silicon some form of intelligence, machine learning, trained machine learning. So uh, the general architecture of what we're thinking is Here's your target circuit. You will have some way to generate stimuli on chip. You will have some sensors that will give you alternate measurements. And there's going to be an on-die machine learning entity that will have to be trained individually per chip. And that could tell you pass-fail or trust it and trust it. Or it could essentially tune the knobs for the operating point of the circuit. And if you can do that, you can do self-test. You can tune the operating points of the device, or you can essentially identify that uh, you can no longer trust your chip as it's operating in the field. So we looked around for what kind of on-chip intelligence we could uh, design and integrate cost-effectively. Our constraints are we need minimal footprint, CMOS compatibility, very low operating power, because you can imagine that we want a tiny little analog neural network to be integrated on every chip to do all of these operations. So it can't be done in the digital domain. It would be too expensive and too power hungry. And we want to be able to, to train this neural network and store the learned weights of the synapses in a non-volatile fashion. So uh, when we started looking at this in about 2009, the most viable technology we could use ended up being floating gates. So we designed a floating gate based experimentation platform, which we can reconfigure into various neural network topologies and which we can uh, train and experiment with. The structure has a main core of uh, uh, 600 synapses and uh, neuro uh, 30 neurons, uh, where, I'm sorry, a 30 by 20 array of synapses and neurons, which we can reconfigure in various topologies. Usually, we designed this to support multi-layer perceptrons on the genic neural networks. We can do any kind of feed-forward uh, network. We have limited capabilities for feedback, uh, but it is also possible in the new chip we're designing, we're allowing more of that. We can also do regression, so we don't just support classification because you can use neural networks for uh, regression as well. There's a lot of peripheral circuits uh, for voltage to current interfaces. The core operates, operates in the current domain. Uh, 
programming the weight memory, uh, getting on-chip current measurements, and various other little things to make this work. Um, our Synapse is designed using the translinear principle. It has a six transistor multiplication core and operates at a, a picoamp to nanoamp, very low power uh, for this multiplier. Our neuron is essentially implementing a threshold function and we can adjust the slope. Uh, the most important part is the weight storage cell which has two modes. This is where the synapse is going, to, the weight of the synapse is going to be stored. There's a floating gate transistor which essentially will store the final value that we want to put this, uh, floating, this floating gate transistor to permanently remember. We can inject charge through hot electron injection, deplete through tunneling. Uh, but when we actually train the neural network, we don't want to be doing tunneling and uh, injection because these are too slow uh, operations. So we have a second option, which is a MOS capacitor, which essentially allows us to very quickly dynamically change the weights that we play with as we train the neural network. And only when we finish tra excuse me, training, we take the final value and we store it into the floating gate transistor. Um, I have to tell you that uh, I don't know how many of you have ever experimented with floating gate transistors, but they're very finicky, very temperamental, and it is quite a challenge to control uh, the hot electron injection and the tunneling. And uh, I admit that in terms of tunneling, we haven't done a very good job. So uh, when we want to erase, we do a global erase, and then we start uh, injecting charge again using hot electron injection. This is our chip. Again, it was built at 350 uh, TSMC. Our new chip is at 130. Uh, we're about to tape out pretty soon. Um, it supports, as I said, various topologies, very low uh, power and very low uh, currents used. Um, we've demonstrated quite some learning ability, and I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a boundary that this we can learn to separate the two input XOR problem, classical uh, classification problem. We have two classes of zero and one for the XOR function, and we swept the inputs, and this is the surface that the neural network learned to separate the problem. This is another classical problem in machine learning, the uh, two spirals problem. So we use the multilayer perceptor, and as we added hidden layers and we retrained, you can see that how the boundary progressed over time. So these were done just to show the learning capacity of this neural network. Then we wanted to put it to the test for the applications that I mentioned earlier, built-in self-test, uh, calibration, and trust monitoring. So, of course, the neural network is not on the chip where the measurements are taken, so it was a two-chip experimental setup. We take the measurements, we record them, and then we present them to the neural network chip for training and then for testing. What we observed for all three problems that we played with is that the difference in how well we can learn from the measurements in software and in hardware was almost negligible. So the neural networks that we can design and implement on this platform are uh, capable of solving the problems that we wanted. Here's one such example with the LNA that I showed you earlier. Uh, using three peak detector measurements, we can train a classifier to learn the greenish gray surface that I have here and you can see the passing and failing devices with respect to six specifications, in this case, noise, figure, and power were also included. And this surface was built with an ontogenic neural network using eight neurons. So it can make almost perfect decisions. There's a couple of devices here at the edges where we couldn't shape it good enough, well enough so that it could perfectly separate them. And this was published a couple of years ago at date. In terms of calibration, again, with the LNA chip, we took the measurements from the three VCOs, and we picked, using the algorithm I showed you earlier, uh, the knob setting, but the regression functions were learned directly through a, a multilayer perceptron. And the decisions that were made by the perceptron uh, made 61 out of 64 chips in the test set pass, essentially recover the yield. Uh, this work is not published yet. And finally, this shows the network, this shows application for self-trust monitoring where we wake up a hardware trojan while operating and we take at runtime signatures from the UWB um, and with uh, current sensors, current mirrors and uh, sensor instrumentation, we integrate the current, we trans uh, transform to voltage and then this is in the voltage space, 
the boundary that is learned. So occasionally we miss a few of the activations for certain blocks, but because we keep checking every few clock cycles, with an average of 23 clock cycles, we were able to detect the remaining 6% of the uh, cases that the Trojan were active and we didn't catch it the first time around. Okay, I am running out of town time, so um, let me summarize. The key conjecture and the overarching theme of a lot of what uh, my research group does is to take ideas from machine learning and statistical analysis. And we've shown that this can help us develop effective solutions for providing trustworthiness and reliability, especially in the analog RFIC domain. Uh, I showed you three applications, test cost reduction, exploring the trade-off between test quality and test cost, tuning knobs for post-production performance calibration, and detecting hardware trojans in wireless cryptographic ICs. I also discussed our efforts in developing on-die learning capabilities through analog neural network design so that we can enable self-test, self-calibration, and self-trust monitoring solutions. And our demonstrations involve large industrial data sets and custom designed silicon. As far as next steps, uh, we are looking, with support from SRC, we're looking into applications of machine learning into jointly exploring design, fabrication, and test trade-offs with the objective of maximizing the yield of the process. So we're trying to capture the interplay between uh, design, uh, marginalities, process variation, and uh, uh, test cost so that we can optimize this process. We have recently uh, been awarded a, an NSF medium uh, grant to look into the risk of hardware trojans in wireless networks where essentially we are trying to understand the gap between the physical communication limits and where actual transceivers operate and figure out ways of hiding extra information in that gap, as well as detection and prevention countermeasures. And finally, in terms of on-die learning, uh, again, we have a recent grant from uh, uh, National Science Foundation to build monolithically the solutions that I just showed you so that a little piece of that experimentation platform for, from anal for analog neural networks gets integrated on every die and we can then uh, demonstrate the self-test, self-calibration, and self-trust monitoring capabilities. Um, a lot of people have contributed to this work. My former postdoc, Ke Huang, now at San Diego State University. Uh, several PhD students at Yale, Haralambos, Nate, Dmitri, and Yer. Um, my current PhD, some of my current PhD students, Yu, Yichuan, Kiruba, and George, uh, have one academic collaborator from RPI who is more on the theory side, on the machine learning side, and several people from industry, from Global Foundries, John Karuli, Mustafa Slamani from IBM, and Surya Natarajan from Intel. And pieces of this work have been uh, sponsored by various entities, NSF, SRC, Intel, LSI, uh, IBM, and TI. I've included a number of references for each of the four parts of the talk since this is being recorded, and you can go and look up more information for test cost reduction, performance calibration, the wireless crypto uh, hardware trojan work, and the online, uh, the on-chip analog neural network experimentation platform. And with that, uh, I will stop here. If you have questions, I'll be happy to address them. And even after the talk, feel free to email me if you want to discuss further. Thank you. So we do have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to the size that uh, you, by changing the knob, uh, you move uh, the tail back in. Uh, so I'm wondering, do you assume like the spacks on the x-axis and y-axis have a trade-off between each other? No, that was a cartoon figure just to show the principle that if you design more aggressively, process variations will hurt you more. So more chips are going to fail. So there's a trade-off about between um, High performance and uh, uh, manufacturability. So, so you're not saying by tuning the knobs we can uh, bring the tail back in the. That's exactly what the purpose of uh, the calibration is to bring that tail back by 
essentially trimming the device after you have fabricated because that trimming counteracts what process variations did during manufacturing. I mean, if you have a trade-off between X axis and Y axis, say uh, X axis is noise filter, Y axis is uh, power consumption. Yes. I mean, there is no way you, if, if the chip is fading both out noise filter and power consumption, there is no way. Correct. You turn it back. So some chips will never be healed. And in fact, there's a trade-off between these parameters. So your optimization criterion that drives the final selection of the knobs need to be uh, reflecting your choices of how much do you care about you know, minimizing power consumption, maximizing gain, or whatever the uh, relative weights of the various parameters are. And all of this can be captured during the training uh, or during the formation of the optimization function that gives you the final knob selection. No, so I'm thinking you're increasing the yield rate not by moving the data in the third quadrant into the first quadrant, but by moving the data in the second and fourth back into the first quadrant. By oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so yes. Again, this was a cartoon figure to convey the concept that you're just trying to push the distribution. But your point is valid that if everything is failing, then there's no trade-off to leverage to fix the device, and uh, some of these devices will not be healable. So I'm curious, in the TI study that you did, you used a single wafer uh, to train 100 and something, 150 mm -hmm. wafers or whatever it was. Uh, and I'm curious, if, you, if is, that, is that the way you would see it being done in production, or? No. no? Okay. Because you have to close the, the loop. Right. The, you know, every lot might have different characteristics. So, any time in production that you change something significant, whether it is materials, whether it is masks, whether it is equipment, or it's just another batch, it is possible that your statistics will have jumped around. So you will periodically, or at these points in time, take a new sample, feed it back into what you have, and adjust the boundaries that you have learned or the regression functions. So you need to close the loop. In this regard, the two-tier test helps because the devices that are right on the cusp, right on the boundary, for which you're not confident to make a decision, you will throw them into the full uh, suite of tests. And now that you have this information, you can use it to retrain and more accurately shape the boundary right there. Do you see this uh, being used to kind of alter the way that fabrication is done instead of randomizing fabrication, sort of having a known path through the tool sets that, that can be trained individually? Or? Yes, but keep in mind that the same set of tools is used for multiple designs. Sure. So the interaction between design and fabrication is very tricky. And um, even, so the, the process is monitored through what is called PCMs, process control monitors, or e-tests. These are structures that are put on the wafer right on the scribe lines. So the, the process guys continuously monitor the process by measuring these parameters. Now, even if you knew the perfect sweet spot in the process for your design, the, the process guys are not going to give you exactly that because they need to cater to many other designs that are going through the fab at the time. Plus, there's only that much fine tuning they can do to get the process in a particular spot and they cannot quite hold it there forever. So, but there's a very interesting interaction between you know, what your SPICE model tells you when you do simulations, what silicon provides, and uh, how all of this can be combined in order to you know, help you design better, help you test better, and help you manufacture better. So that's precisely the project we're looking at with SRC at this point. <coughs> Let's take one, one last question. Chris, you have, you have your quote here. <laughs> Although I never, uh, uh, anyway, thank you for the talk. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can help me still. I'm stuck on, you know, what we do traditionally, like real systems on a chip, communication systems on a chip, they have very sophisticated um, calibration algorithms that run, you know, literally, I would, it's probably about 100 or even more than 100 depending on the type of chip. Across the chip, it's using the digital that's available to do the calibrations, okay? So I would argue that digital that's being used, a lot of that's being used by the chip during normal operation for computation on the back end of the, of the transceiver. 
So my question is, on the, in, with respect to the neural networks and the machine algorithm learning, what's, what would be the benefit of doing this? I, I heard area perhaps would be smaller, but I would argue a lot, because you wouldn't need the digital portion of that, uh, but I would argue that a lot of the digital that's available on these type of chips, it's already going to be, it's there. It needs to be used for normal operation. Um, and number two is in the neural network and machine learning uh, approach that you have, you mentioned translinear circuits, and I think you also mentioned something related to sub-threshold biasing, which is extremely different. People have been struggling with that problem for 30 years. So that's a, that's a, those are very valid problems, but just generally speaking, what about the process variation and the variation in the neural network itself, okay. right? The thing that's yes. actually doing the measurement. It's like now you're getting into Pandora's box. Okay, I need to calibrate this up. So question's twofold. What, what's the difference between machine, this machine learning approach and neural network and what we already do in systems on a chip? All right, and number two is how would you address in this neural network approach the variation in the the measurement circuits okay. themselves. I'll take the second question first because it is easier. Uh, remember that we train the neural network after we have fabricated it. And every chip will be individually trained. So in that way, you can absorb the impact of process variations on the parameters of the neural network itself. So every neural network, even if you wanted the exact same boundary to be learned, will have a different set of weights stored in its synapses because exactly of the problem you mentioned. So we can deal with the problem of process variations slightly perturbing the neural network itself because we train it after it is fabricated. So we have the last word, essentially. Now, for the first question, um, it depends what you're calibrating for and what circuits you're talking about. Obviously, if you have a transceiver and you're willing to take these measurements and cross from A to D and go to your microcontroller or your DSP or your microprocessor on board, to calibrate, what algorithm would you be running to calibrate? Chances are you, that you would be running a very similar statistical algorithm to figure out the optimal knob. So what we're saying is that if you don't have the resources on chip to do that, it is possible to do this without these resources. Either externally, if you have a you know, low cost die, I'm not talking about an entire transceiver, and you want to get high performance. Um, you could use this right after fabrication with the calibration algorithm running in software on your AT equipment. And then once you calibrate, you, perf you permanently store this information. And from then on, you know that this chip can be solved. It meets its specifications. So you don't have to do calibration every time the chip wakes up. Okay. So it is basically for low end devices that you don't have or you are unable to interface with on chip digital resources for processing. But even if you do cross into that domain, the work that I'm familiar with, even the paper that I showed, uh, Professor Chatterjee's paper with the DSP work, the DSP runs on a non-chip micro microcontroller. So it is a different flavor of what you're mentioning, which happens once rather than every time you power on your chip. And it can be applied to chips that do not have the on-chip resources for doing the calibration. Thank you very much, uh, Yorgos. Thank you for Thank you for inviting me.